but I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely on the damned spot. Now have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the senses? Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates a soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, and so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of the old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. And in an instant I dragged him to the floor, pulled the heavy bed over him. I smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes but there was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned. I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. Then I took up three planks in the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down and opened it with a light heart, for what have I to fear now? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own, in a dream. The old man I mentioned was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, with the wild audacity of my triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied my manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted familiar things, but ere long, I thought. I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached. I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still they chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased. 
And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. Much as a sound a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise increased steadily. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observation of the men. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they had not heard? Almighty God, no. They heard, they suspected, they knew. But they were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, louder, louder, hark, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here is the beating of his hideous heart.